Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Emily Olszewski, and today our team will be presenting on our project Smooth Sail. Uh, we're really excited to share our project with you, so let's get started. This is a team that worked on Smooth Sail. Our team consisted of myself, Bradley, Daria, and Isaac. As you can see, we are located around the country, so we are a remote-based team uh, that built this project together. Our agenda for today, uh, we're going to start by covering our problem domain, a little bit of background knowledge to understand the context of why we built Smooth Sail and the engineers that could benefit from the use of Smooth Sail. Next, we'll dive into Smooth Sail itself and how it works and work our way into a discussion of Smooth Sail's architecture and why and how we built it the way that we did. We'll finish with a quick summary of Smooth Sail and take any questions you may have at that time. Um, also, feel free to drop them in the Q&A uh, in the chat, and we can cover them at the end. So first, let's start with an idea. Let's imagine that a software engineer brainstorms and thinks and comes up, up with a new idea for their product. Let's assume that this idea is a new feature to their product. That new feature could be something like a new search bar for their application. So our software engineer starts developing this new feature, codes the new feature, and it's ready to go to the production environment. Now we need to get that feature to the end user. Traditionally, that process looked a lot like deploying the feature to the production environment, and once it exists in the production environment, releasing that feature to the end user. But let's complicate this process even more by realizing that companies will have different engineers working on different features that need to be deployed and released as well. And let's add a little bit more to that and recognize that time is everything, time is money. Companies wanna move fast, they wanna iterate fast, and they want those new features to make it to the end users. So knowing that we have a speed, a focus on speed for getting those new features to the end user, let's dive in a little deeper to the deployment and release part of that process. What exactly happens when we say we deploy the new feature? What happens in that deployment process? Well, deployment encompasses the installation of a different software version into a production environment. Deployment is getting that code that was written for the new feature into the production environment servers. This means that we are transferring and configuring software files to the right servers, making sure that any dependencies are satisfied, and the application is ready for use on the right servers. This means that the code that was just developed and written for our new feature now exists on the servers for that production environment. So we deployed our code for our feature, and now it exists on the production environment. What is a release then? Well, the release is different and distinct from that deployment. And it is the process of making that system or a portion of the system available to the end users. At this point, when the feature is released, the feature is available to the end users. So while deployment and release seem very similar, they are different and distinct processes. Traditionally, processes of deployment and release were executed together. If you are deploying your new features to the production environment, you would be releasing the new features to the end users at that time meaning that end users would be able to see and use those new features that engineers were just working on. I mean, we talk about speed and wanting end users to receive those new features quickly. Why not just couple the deployment and release together? There are actually quite a few downsides to that tightly coupled deployment and release. First, there is an inability to release features independently. Because different engineers will most likely be working on different features, it is not uncommon to find that different features will be ready for deployment at different times. Or you may just be in a situation where a company wants to release different features at different times because their business needs. If we do decide that deployment and release should happen together for each feature, what happens if we encounter a delay in the deployment? The cascading impact of that delay could really hurt the schedule and timing of the release and other deployment and releases. So not only do you have a delay in one, but you really could affect other deployments and releases. How do you handle the situation where you have deployed and released the new features to end users and you discover there is a bug in one of your features that you have deployed, but the rest of the release features are working exactly as you expect. 
it's actually incredibly challenging to replicate a production environment for testing new features. So you can see how easily engineers could find a buggy feature when that feature is deployed and released to end users. Unfortunately, there's no way to roll back just one buggy feature. That one buggy feature affects the entire deployment, meaning that successful or not, all new features are being rolled back. Not only does that mean you're removing, success, removing successful features, but you have exposed a buggy feature to your end users. Production rollbacks can be quite complex. They can be lengthy and they can be a very difficult process. And that brings us to our last point. Any error or complication in either the deployment or in the release is going to affect the other. And that really opens up the surface area for something going wrong and affecting the entire deployment and release process. But if you're not, you do not have to execute a deployment at the same time as your release. So we are gonna talk about two ways that you can de decouple your deployment and release. First is what's called a blue-green deployment, and then we'll cover a canary deployment. So what is a blue-green deployment? A blue-green deployment is when you have two production environments with each production environment on its own set of infrastructure. One production environment is known as the blue, as seen on the left of this diagram, and it has the older or stable software version. The production environment known as the green, as seen on the right of the diagram, has the newly deployed software version with the new features. This is that deployment process being done by putting that new software version in that green production environment. So when engineers are ready to release the new software version, they will shift all traffic to the green environment. At this point, the new software version has been released to all end users. So in this blue-green deployment, how do you handle unsuccessful releases? Previously, we had to talk about production rollbacks, which can get really complex and quite lengthy. But in the blue-green deployment, when you have an unsuccessful release, all traffic is shifted back to the blue version, which is the known stable version, which can make the rollback relatively easy. There are some limitations though for the blue-green deployment. First, it's extremely resource intensive. You're maintaining two sets of infrastructure, each with their own production environment. It can also be very complex maintaining both of those sets of infrastructure with their in production environments. But the real downfall of the blue-green is if you have an unsuccessful release, all of your end users will be exposed to that unsuccessful release. So with that limitation of blue-green deployments in mind, let's shift to a different feature release strategy. Let's talk about canary deployments. A canary deployment is performed by deploying two production environments within the same infrastructure. One production environment will have the stable software version, which is the blue servers in our diagram, and the other production environment will have the newest software version containing the new features, which is the green server in our diagram. This is the deployment portion of the canary deployment. And when engineers are ready to release the new software version, the load balancer will direct a percentage of traffic to the new version. In our diagram, 5% of our users are exposed to the new release. When the release is deemed successful, engineers can ramp up the percentage of users that are receiving the recent release. As you can see in the diagram, we now have 25% of our users that the new software version has been released to. But how would you handle unsuccessful releases in this release strategy? Previously, when the release was deemed successful, we increased the percentage of users directed to the new software version. However, in unsuccessful releases, engineers will decrease or roll back the percentage of users. As you can see in the diagram, we have now rolled back to 5%. Engineers can decide to lower this percentage or stop directing any traffic to the new software version, depending on why the release was deemed unsuccessful. While the Canary deployment has some real benefits in controlling the percentage of traffic and releasing to a smaller percentage of users, there are still some limitations with this feature release strategy. First, there's some real complexity added in configuring your infrastructure to perform a Canary deployment, as well as engineers need to monitor the Canary deployment and determine when and by how much the percentage of users needs to change. 
The other limitation that canary deployments have is when we, re we release features, certain users may or may not be his understanding of unsuccessful releases. For example, some users may want to play around with new features, and they understand those new features may have some room for improvement still. Other, other users may not be as understanding of unsuccessful release of new features. It can be very important for an engineering team to precisely identify which users fall into that beta test category and are more understanding of the impact, uh, the impact new features may cause. Teams may just want to have more precision in identifying those users receiving a new release for a variety of different reasons. For that fine grain control, while still being able to decouple deployment and release, there is another feature release strategy. And I will turn it over to Bradley to discuss that strategy. Thanks, Emily. So that strategy will be feature flags, but what are feature flags? Feature flags determine which code sections are executed during runtime, appearing as conditionals that dictate the code path to take. That's a concise definition of what feature flags are, but just to understand this even further and to understand why it's beneficial to use feature flags in our code, I wanna take a step back to cover something software engineers are very familiar with, conditionals. As developers, conditionals are something we see every day. They're a fundamental concept that you'll find in all programming languages. From the lens of computer science, conditionals are a way for developers to let the computer know how to handle a decision. Conditionals tell a computer to perform different actions based on a condition which either evaluates to true or false. So as we see here on the right, we have a variable feature on that's set to true. Since it's true, the new search function is used. If we were to set feature on to false, we would use our old search function. This works fine, but what if we want to change which feature is being used while our code is still running? There's no way to do that without redeploying our whole application. This is where feature flags come in. There are these conditionals in your code that can be toggled on or off externally without redeploying your application. They live in the application as opposed to the strategies we discussed earlier, which existed at the infra infrastructure level. We see here that we replace the Boolean with a flag called new search, which can be turned on and off while the application is still running. So if the flag is toggled on, we get the new search function. And if the flag is toggled off, we get the old search function. So you can imagine with this capability that we have some advantages to using feature flags. First, we now have more fine-grained control of who gets a feature and when they get that feature. So if you're an engineer at a company that only wants that feature available when it's ready instead of when it's deployed, you can do that. The feature can be deployed with the flag off, and when the company is ready to make it available, you can just toggle that flag on. We also have the advantage of fast rollback being made easy because we have the ability to just toggle that flag off if there's any problems with our new feature. We no longer need to roll back the entire release through redeployment. Feature flags enable a developer to have simplicity of feature release through simplified infrastructure while still having the de deployment decoupled from release. Blue-green and canary deployments both require you to keep up with multiple production environments. With feature flags, we can work within one environment. Lastly, it enables engineers to test safely in production. I wanna frame this by saying testing is an important part of any software lifecycle, but testing and staging environments have their limitations. Replicating live real world systems in testing or staging environments can be difficult. Also using simulated data for test or using a subset of real data might not actually represent the user population of your actual application. This is also not mentioning the availability of resources at many companies. It can be hard to make time for employees to write tests if you're just trying to iterate fast on your product and that will slow everything down. Feature flags make it so we can test in production on a real world system, but have that safety blanket of being able to toggle the feature back to a stable version easily. As with pretty much everything in software engineering, feature flags do come with their trade-offs. For one, although it's not as complex as blue-green or canary deployments, there is increased complexity if we're managing multiple features with multiple feature flags. Also, there is potential for accumulation of dead code remaining in your repository once a flag is no longer in use. In this case, these cons can be combated by cleaning up 
feature flags when no longer in use. So I think the pros outweigh the cons. The simplest use case for a feature flag is to use it as a simple toggle. This does separate the deployment from the release, but similar to blue green deployment, we have an all or nothing approach. Either all the users have the new feature or none of them do. If there is a bug with our new feature, every user will be affected. To mitigate this, feature flags can, pro can provide user targeting capabilities. There are two primary ways users are targeted, just randomly selecting users and selecting them based on attributes that are associated with them. With random user selection, the user is selected randomly to get the new feature or not. The problem with this is that you're still risking exposing potential bugs to users who may not want to deal with them. The alternative to this is to select users based on their attributes. This could be whether that user signed up to be a beta tester, so they're okay with dealing with some bugs to help make your application better. It could be where they live or if they have a work email, any attribute that's associated with that user. We see here that our new feature on the bottom has been deployed and our feature flag is on for internal users, but off for beta testers and all global users. User targeting enables us to have the feature on for whatever user group, group we would like. So that brings us to our project, SmoothSail. SmoothSail is a self-hosted open source feature flag software that enables developers to release new features independently of deployment. It's self-hosted so any developer can run and maintain it on their own infrastructure. It's open source, meaning the source code is available for any developer to inspect and customize to fit their own use case. SmoothSail can manage all of the flag data and deliver that to your application whenever there is a flag update or another instance of your application spins up. This way you can toggle flags from outside of the application if there are any unforeseen bugs or degraded performance caused by one of your features. These feature flags are intended for server-side use and come with user targeting capabilities through the use of user context and reusable segments. So what do I mean by user context and reusable segments? Well, all user context is, is an object of key value pairs that provide information about a user. So here we have Leela's user context with some information about her. She lives in New York, she's a beta tester, her species is homo sapien, et cetera. This user context can be used in conjunction with rules to determine if a user fits into a segment. So here we have some examples of rules that can be evaluated. We have Leela's user context here on the left and some rules on the right. Since Leela is a beta tester, that evaluates the true. She lives in New York, not Washington, so this second rule is false, and her name is Leela, so that evaluates to true. You can just think of a segment as a collection of those rules that get evaluated using user context to determine if they belong to that segment. Here we have Leela, Zoidberg, and Bender with user context that represents them. We have two rules in the middle, species is not homo sapien and name is Bender. The user context gets evaluated against these rules and determines who gets what feature. Since Bender is not a homo sapien and his name is Bender, he gets served the new feature. These collections of rules or segments can be reused across multiple flags for a better developer experience. That way you wouldn't have to create similar segments multiple times for different flags. And that's how SmoothSail accomplishes user targeting. Feature flags are toggles that are either on or off. Those flags can be associated with zero or more segments. And those segments are collections of rules that are evaluated using user context. We designed SmoothSail with reliability and consistency in mind, so we needed an architecture to facilitate this behavior. Our architecture is made up of four main components, the manager platform, Nats Jetstream, our SDK service, and the SDK, which gets embedded in the user application. I wanna pass it off to my teammate, Isaac, so he can explain what these components do and how we made decisions to get to an architecture like this. Thanks, Bradley. Before we get into the details of each component, Let's take a step back and look at how we got here. When initially approaching the design of the SmoothSail application, our team carefully considered the essential functionalities that would define its core capabilities. These key features included the ability to handle feature flag data and their respective user targeting information, an intuitive and user-friendly dashboard, the administration of authentication keys and their verification process, 
efficient and reliable delivery of feature flag data to a user's application, and the establishment of persistent connections to a user's application, ensuring real-time updates for enhanced responsiveness. As we moved forward, we began to notice that the backend server of our application was handling an increasing number of features, leading to a potential single point of failure. In the event of the manager server going down, the user's application wouldn't be able to run using feature flags. To address this, we made a strategic decision to divide the application's functionalities into two distinct components, the manager platform and the SDK service. Now, let's, let's delve into the advantages that our decision to split our application brings. The division into separate components grants the flexibility to scale each component independently. By distributing the application's functionalities, we effectively decrease the load on a single server. This not only boosts performance, but also mitigates the risk of a complete system failure in case of server issues. The separation also allows us to reduce the attack surface of our application and enhance the overall security of our, app of our system our application gains a higher level of reliability as well. When one component encounters issues, the other can continue to function independently, ensuring uninterrupted service for our users. Introducing an additional application to maintain does bring a level of complexity to our architecture, but we believe that the benefits in scalability, server load, security, and reliability far outweigh the added complexity. Next, let's take a closer look at the core component of our application, the manager platform. The manager platform consists of a graphical user interface, a Node.js Express backend, and a Postgres database. The dashboard allows users to create, view, edit, and delete feature flag and user targeting information. While the manager backend server supports those operations, while relying on a Postgres database as a source of truth for our app. The manager platform is also responsible for the generation of SDK keys and their authentication process, ensuring that only authorized user applications can connect to our app. And finally, the manager is responsible for relaying feature flag data to our next component, the SDK service. The SDK service acts as an intermediary between the manager and the applications of our users. It facilitates communication between the two by initiating and maintaining persistent connections with the user's application. It is also responsible for keeping and updating an in-memory cache of the most recent feature flag data, thus allowing the SDK service to forward accurate data to the user's application in real time with minimal latency. Now, Dario will walk us through the key factors influencing our decisions about communication across our app and provide an overview of how data flows throughout the smooth sale architecture. All right. Um, Isaac has mentioned we split functionality of our application into two parts, and now we have two services, manager platform and SDK service. The next question that we needed to answer is, how those two applications should communicate. And we identified three major criteria for the communication channel between those two parts. Those are reliability, since the network is inherently unreliable, it was paramount for our team to make sure that the communication channel between the manager and SDK service is reliable so that if a flag is changed, the data about this change must be reliably delivered from manager platform to SDK service. Secondly is uh, scalability. If SDK service experiences a high load and needs to be horizontally scaled, the communication channel should be able to scale with it, preferably without the need for additional configuration. And third requirement is bi-directional communication support. On one hand, we needed um, the manager to be able to send notifications about any flag data change to SDK service. And on the other hand, 
SDK service should be able to request feature flag data on startup, as well as send SDK authentication requests to the manager. Given these requirements, our choice fell on message broker, in particular NAS Just Stream. So what is NAS Just Stream? NAS is a distributed PubSub message broker that is specifically used for implementing communication between applications. And JetStream is a built-in persistence layer on top of the core NAT server. It adds additional functionality such as at least once and exactly once message delivery guarantees. Why NAS JetStream is a good fit for our case? Let's come back to the three criteria mentioned before. First, reliability. NAS JetStream supports at least one message delivery guarantee, so that if the sender does not receive acknowledgement of message delivery, it will replay the message until it does. Second, scalability. Now, the messages about flag updates needed to be sent from manager platform to SDK service. And if SDK service is scaled, the communication channel should scale too. PubSub communication patterns supported by NATS is a good fit for this scenario. We can have one publisher, the manager, and multiple subscribers, SDK services. And this will not require any additional configuration of the broker. The third bidirectional communication. As we just saw, the PubSub is a one directional channel. However, SDK service should also be able to send requests to the manager, so we need communication channel in the opposite direction too. For this purpose, we can use NAT's request reply pattern, where SDK service sends a request to the manager and waits for reply. And since request reply communication also supports at least once message delivery, it meets our reliability requirements as well. Now that we have manager platform and SDK service communicate reliably, how do we deliver flag information to the application that uses feature flags? Well, we do it with a software development kit, SDK. The main responsibilities of SDK include authentication with smooth sale, receiving live flag data and storing it in memory, and evaluating flags during runtime. Now that we have um, now that we have that, uh, we need SDK service to somehow communicate with our SDKs. How do we do, how do we do that? Uh, and after careful consideration, we narrowed our choice to server sent events, aka SSC. SSC is a server push technology enabling a client to receive automatic updates from a server through a persistent one-way HTTP connection. In our case, the client receiving live updates is SDK, and the server sending them is SDK service. We also implemented a heartbeat mo to monitor SSC channel. We chose SSC because it provides built-in support for re-establishing connections, it requires minimal HTTP traffic, scales easily, and its implementation requires no additional dependencies. Now that we went over our architecture, uh, let's review how all the pieces work together to fulfill smooth sale functionality. Let's start from the beginning, authentication. When we spin up a new instance of the application that uses smooth sale flags to establish SSC connection, SDK needs to authenticate with SDK service. To do that, SDK sends a POST request to SDK service authentication endpoint with encrypted key in the header. SDK service in its turn relays the key to the manager for checking and waits for the response. Once the manager confirms that the key is valid, SDK service opens SSC connection with SDK and sends full flag rule set right away. The SSC connection is kept alive and used for real-time flag notifications. 
so that if developer changes a flag, it can be a toggle or change in the segment rule, manager stores the update in database and at the same time publishes notification about the change to pub sub channel. SDK service receives the message updates in memory flag data and sends flag update to all connected SDKs. All right, let's now take a moment to wrap up our journey with Smooth Sail today. To reiterate what is Smooth Sail, it is an open source, scalable, self hosted feature flag tool that empowers software developers to seamlessly release new features to specific user demographics and roll back faulty features with a button click. Thank you all for your attention. Now we'll be delighted to answer any questions you might have. Okay, so we actually have two questions right now. Um, I'll read it out so you guys know. So first question was, what animations were used to build this presentation? Um, so Isaac really took the lead on this presentation, so I'll let him uh, speak to that. Um, so for the graphics, I used Figma, which was a uh, program that I used to create all the images in separate layers um, that allowed me to reuse those images throughout various graphics and also allowed me to export them with transparent backgrounds so they could be used for animations. Um, and for those animations, I use Keynote. Awesome. Yeah, Isaac, you really did a great job in this presentation and hopefully everyone enjoyed it as much as uh, we did seeing the end product of it. Uh, next question was, why was Nat Stream picked over something else like Apache Kafka? Um, so we did prototype a couple different options uh, for that message broker that we talked about. Uh, we ended up choosing Nat's Jetstream um, for the reasons that we covered today. Um, the two other tools that we took a look at were Apache Kafka and RabbitMQ. I'll speak to RabbitMQ and why we didn't uh, pick that tool as I prototyped it, and then I'll turn it over to Bradley to talk about Apache Kafka because he prototyped that. Um, RabbitMQ, so we found some research that indicated that the latency was lower for NAT Jetstream than RabbitMQ as far as message delivery. And when we were prototyping RabbitMQ, we noticed there was a lot of great functionality. Um, and that is great for the uses of large scale um, and production uh, ready uh, servers and, and use cases. We felt like for our use case and the scale that we anticipated of SmoothSail, that RabbitMQ's features would be uh, too much of an overhead and, and could create um, and complicate our process. Uh, so that's why we didn't choose RabbitMQ and, and Bradley, I'll let you speak to uh, Apache Kafka. Yeah, as far as uh, Apache Kafka goes, um, they're really targeted towards, uh, they're targeted towards applications that are outputting really high volumes of, of data. And in the case of our tool, um, as far as how many messages are going to be are going to be sent, Apache Kafka is just overkill for an application like this. That's kind of the reason we decided not to go with that one. Yeah, thanks, Bradley. And yeah, you, we already highlighted why we picked uh, Nat's Jetstream, so I won't uh, <laughs> overkill that. Uh, next question was: How many users would an application like this be able to support? Um, that's a great question, and while we were making it, we had that question as well. So we actually did load testing um, with a service called Artillery um, that allows you to uh, create virtual users that will use your application to ramp that up. Um, so we started with 10 requests per second, ramped up to 100 requests per second, and then up to 1,000 requests per second, which would reasonably be much more than um, our application would be able to be able to reasonably expect, um, but we did that for the purpose of seeing where the production or per, excuse me the performance was for our smooth sale. So we started to notice um, so a slight performance degradation around 500 requests per second, um, and we expect that uh, we we could reasonably handle what the scale of smooth sale would um, expect. 
And we have more uh, information on that load testing process in our uh, project website in our write-up if you're interested in getting more in-depth. And if you have more questions, we'd be happy to answer them offline um, after this. So. Uh, so that was all the questions that we had. Um, but if you do have any other questions that you guys think of, please feel free to reach out via Slack. Um, we really enjoyed creating this project and would love to talk to you guys about it um, even more. So thanks for attending today. I hope you enjoyed the presentation uh, and let us know if you think of anything else that you want to talk about.